Thank you. So first of all, a very big thank you to Adam and his team. It was a wonderful conference, first time I've been here. And uh, I just wish we could have this conference maybe twice a year in future. To, there's just too much to talk about all the time. I think everybody probably feels the same that the question and answer period could go on for a long time. Um, so I have no uh, conflicts of interest that I know about. Um, I'm going to assume that rats do experience positive and negative affect, whatever that means, to the extent that it's interesting to study and, and potentially useful. Um, my lab's interested in trying to develop USVs uh, as a measure of depressive-like behavior. We're not there yet, but um, that's the area I want to go into. So anybody who's read Animal Farm will remember that four legs are good and two legs are bad. And this was really... When I started getting interested in USVs, I sort of got seduced into the field thinking that they were simple and a lot easier to do than intravenous self-administration and condition place preference and other things like that. Uh, I thought that USVs were going to give me a direct readout of whether the animal was feeling good or bad. Um, how wrong was I? I think it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, so let's have a look at this idea then. And um, so... If we start with 22 kilohertz calls, of course, yes, they can occur in uh, aversive situations. Um, I totally get that. But as Stefan and others have shown, that they are heterogeneous. Um, as Stefan mentioned this morning, they occur post-ejaculation. Um, so I don't think that sort of directly fits the negative affect thing necessarily. Um, and also in, um, in published work using a painful stimulus, um, no 22 kilohertz uh, USVs. In our own work, some of it published with morphine withdrawal and acute naloxone, um, these drug states produce a condition place aversion very clearly, but did not elicit 22 kilohertz USVs. And then um, a no number of other aversive drugs, which are manuscript in preparation, um, did not uh, induce 22 kilohertz USV. So there are a number of situations where one can imagine the rat is feeling negative affect, but they're not making 22 kilohertz calls. Um, so sorry if I got the date wrong here, Jeff. Maybe it was a year before. Um, so what about the idea that 50 kilohertz calls, and particularly the 50 kilohertz call rate, is an uh, index of positive affect? Well, clearly there are quite a number of uh, positive emotional situations where rats make 50 kilohertz calls. Um, and, uh, you know, this is obviously this idea has given rise to numerous studies. Still read in the literature people saying we use 50 kilohertz USVs as a readout of positive affect, which I think needs to be qualified, um, not least because rats also make 50 kilohertz calls in aversive situations, such as an intruder who's been um, entering uh, a residence enclosure and is likely to get beaten up. Um, also in morphine withdrawal, we've published that, and aversive drugs. Um, also, the rats still make 50 kilohertz calls, unpublished work there. So um, given that these calls are heterogeneous, uh, Jeff came up with the idea, I think it was pretty sure it was you, um, that uh, it was actually a subset of 50 kilohertz calls, uh, the frequency modulated ones that were hedonic. Now, how do we define that exactly? Well, um, here I've picked out from a couple of Jeff's papers. I don't know if these verbal descriptions actually are quite the same or whether it's shifted over time. We can talk about that later. Um, so when we got into the game uh, with our first paper in 2010, we were interested in seeing if we, we could classify these 50 kilohertz calls because it was clear just reading the literature, looking at figures, that there, there were different types of, seemed to be different types of calls. So we collected a lot of calls, I think about 20,000 calls, subtyped them all. Um, this was work by Jen Wright, and she looked at rats uh, when they were tested singly versus in pairs, and she looked at the effect of amphetamine acutely on calling as well. Um, this is a general method section which applies to pretty much everything I'm going to say today. So we use the Abisoft equipment. Um, unfortunately, so far, we've only looked at male adult rats. Um, Typically, we use a counterbalance design, uh, repeated measures, so each rat is tested under each condition wherever possible to increase statistical power. Um, we, in our early studies, pre-screened animals with that three doses of amphetamine across days uh, and screened out uh, the rats that didn't call or called very little, um, which is... Um, which makes the experiments more expensive and the results harder to generalize. Um, when I uh, describe an experiment where rats were tested in pairs, then the experimental unit is pairs, not rats. And um, 
what else? We sell them C22 kilohertz calls. Um, maybe our rats are Canadian and very polite and don't complain and threaten. And I don't know. Um, and in our later papers, we've set significance of 1%. And the reason for that is that we get a lot of measures. when Once you start uh, dealing with 14 different subtypes of 50 kilohertz calls, you've got an awful lot of statistical tests. So it's simply a way of trying to protect ourselves against too many false positives. So here's our first study then in 2010. And so Jen Wright tested animals either singly or in pairs with an amphetamine dose response. And um, so we immediately saw, you know, lots of different kinds of 50 kilohertz calls. Um, this is slightly faster than real time, uh, but clearly a great number. And we actually printed them out and, and cut them into little squares and put them on a long table and started to mix and match, you know. And so eventually we decided that there were about 14 different piles of paper. And um, that's how we came up with these 14 different subtypes of calls, but were they calls? So we had to defocalize the rats to find out. So when, when our veterinarian cut the laryngeal nerve, um, then it silenced the animals virtually. So we were pretty confident then that we were dealing with vocalizations and not some artifact. And at this point we thought, well, this is going to conquer the world. Everybody's going to start subtyping 14 different ways. Um, and it'll produce standardization in the field. Everybody will be talking about the same thing, and um, we'll, we'll uh, there'll be a, the field will become more disciplined, and we will get lots of citations. And it doesn't really happen that way. I think about fifteen groups in the world have used our system. Some have used it and then backed off. Uh, some people have based their own system on ours, and some people keep going with their own. Uh, less complicated system and it's a very laborious thing subtyping to the degree that we do it uh, I totally get that um, now after we've published our first paper we found that rats completely conform to our system you know they got the message and they uh, they made calls that pretty much fell within our 14 categories with few exceptions um, but uh, you know this is just a work in progress obviously we could have a whole meeting probably about how to subtype rat calls or mouse calls um, and there would be definitely a great range of opinion on this and I think it's worrying for the field that we don't have any uniformity actually one advantage in our fine-grained approach is we can back translate so if we report 14 calls subtypes we can calculate and convert it into Marcus's system, for example, I think. Um, but the, re the reverse is not true. Now, of course, we don't really know what these subtypes mean to rats. Do they recognize 14 subtypes? I somehow doubt that, right? And does a, a rat see these as all the same category? Or do they have different meanings? Who knows? Does a single, a given call, mean different things in different situations. We don't know much about that either. So, um, you know, it's a matter of personal choice what kind of system you use to classify calls. So anyway, back to the data. So what Jen found, first of all, was that when she tested rats singly, they made roughly half the calls were flat calls. And across many years of study now, we find that flat and trill calls are the predominant subtypes in almost any situation. Um, so that was single rats, and then the rats tested in parallel, in pairs, um, many more trills as a percentage, and fewer flats. And that's really what we pursued for a long time, was this balance between trills and flats. And um, I should say maybe at this point that we've seen a lot of pie charts today, and um, I think we need to say what we mean. How was a pie chart produced? Because there's at least two ways to produce a pie chart. What we could have done, let's take the single rats here. What we could have done is collected all the calls from all rats and then computed a, a pie chart. The trouble with that is that some rats make a hundred times more calls than other rats. Some There's a huge range in call rates. So if you do it that way, you're biasing it towards the high calling rats. Um, so what we do is we essentially compute a pie chart for each individual rat, and then we combine them together. So ours is a, a rat-weighted uh, measure rather than a call-rated measure, you could say. So in the same experiment, then, we were testing the effects of amphetamine and amphetamine dose-dependently increased trills, both in singly and pair-tested animals, and a reduction in flats. So then we've got two, thing, we've got two um, conditions here. We've got social and we've got drug. And in both cases, uh, pair testing and amphetamine 
increase trills, reduce flats. Um, another striking thing is that, you know, if you take a whole bunch of animals and give them a dose of amphetamine, then their call rate is very, very different. And this isn't random variation. We know now that this is consistent individual differences. What is the basis of this great variation? We don't know. I mean, beyond the, you know, the top rat will remain the top rat if you if you repeatedly test him, and the bottom rat will remain the bottom rat on average. Um, so what we found in this experiment, although it's kind of buried in the supplementary, was that not only do rats show consistent individual differences in terms of core rate under amphetamine, but also in terms of call profile. So a rat might prefer to make trill calls, and he'll always tend to do that. Other rat might prefer to make flat calls, always tend to do that. So rat personality, I don't know. Um, be interesting to know what that refers to. Anyway, in, in our latest paper, actually, we tested rats numerous times and then had a three month break and then tested them numerous times again. And here we find each point here is a rat um, that high calling rats remain high calling rats three months later. Rats that make a high percentage of flat calls do the same three months later, same with trills. So we've got a correlation here. So consistent individual differences, love to know what it means. Um, so here's what we call the core profile. So this is the percentage prevalence of each of 14 different subtypes of 50 kilohertz calls. And so we've been fairly fixated on trills and flats, almost always the most predominant subtypes. And we, we, the hypothesis became are trill calls or perhaps trill calls relative to flat calls telling us about positive affect. So far, I think I've only told you about amphetamine and, and uh, pair testing. So that's the hypothesis. And how far can we stretch this? Does it, uh, how generalizable is this really? Um, so next up, we looked at the effects of intravenous amphetamine. Previously, it was IP amphetamine, now intravenous, and also intravenous cocaine, and got the same shift. So increased trills, reduced flats, always in terms of percent prevalence. And then when we looked at, um, when we uh, separated flats and trills, and then we had all the other non-trill FM calls, what we found is that these drugs preferentially affect trills and flats, and they don't really touch all the other FM calls. So that suggests then that the what we call a trill call, which is this sinusoidal call in a spectrogram, may have particular relevance to affect. That was uh, That is what uh, we have. Hypothesized. So then, does this generalize to another euphorogenic drug, morphine? Morphine uh, was given in a dose that uh, was expected to produce a place preference, and it did. And we recorded the rats while they were being conditioned, in other words, under saline and under morphine repeated across days. So we're getting the acute effect of morphine on calling, and then later we test the drug, um, the rat drug free in order to establish that yes, morphine was rewarding in the sense that it produced a place preference. I'm not showing the, the USV data because time is short, but let's just say that in this experiment, in rats that were given morphine acutely and had not previously experienced morphine, the drug did not shift the balance between trill and flat calls. And that to me was a surprise until I delved into the literature from the 1950s when in the US of A, prisoners used to be given um, time off their sentence for volunteering for drug studies. And um, what this established in this paper and others is that um, subjects who were opioid naive didn't actually find morphine predominantly pleasant when it was first taken. Actually, typically dysphoria um, was reported more than euphoria. And it was only in drug experience subjects where the drug produced euphoria. And so we asked whether if we give rats morphine repeatedly, so they're now morphine experienced, will we then get the expected shift in trills and flat calls when we acutely inject morphine? And that's what we did get. Um, this is a repeated measures design, so please don't um, pay too much attention to overlap of error bars. It doesn't tell you about statistical significance because it's repeated measures. But essentially, some sign of an increase in percentage trills, uh, at least at one dose, and a decrease in flat calls. So I would say then that in morphine experience rats, morphine is doing the same sort of thing as amphetamine and cocaine, but maybe not as robustly. Um, what about play behavior? Uh, will this trill flat 
thing work for play behavior. So this was an experiment done actually many years ago, and I'm it's still in preparation. Uh, we wanted to know what kind of calls rats made while they played, and also when they anticipated play. There were 11 pairs of young adult rats, and we tested them across eight consecutive days. And on alternate days, the rats were either separated overnight or they weren't. And there was a five minute pre-play period where they were separated by a plexiglass barrier with holes in it. They could see, they could presumably smell each other, maybe hear each other a little bit, don't know. And then after that, we removed the barrier and allowed them to interact. Overnight separation definitely increased the amount of play behavior. We quantified all that. Um, so let's see what they did when they called during the play period. So this is the first test, and this is during the play period. So they, they've been reunited and trill calls predominated. Um, flat calls were not so prevalent at all. Um, a bit surprising to us was that there was no real difference between the separated overnight and the not separated overnight uh, conditions. Um, all the same. Now, when we go to our final test here, again, trills hugely predominant over flats. And um, these are actually remarkably clean data, if, if you ask me. Um, we did have 11 rat pairs and that, you know, the N probably helps here. But uh, I think a very convincing um, demonstration that when they're playing trills uh, come to the fore. And this really echoes what Jeff had already told us quite a few years before, except it's telling us more specifically, it's the kind of the calls that we call trill calls, which is a subset of what many other people call trill calls. All right, so what about during anticipation? Um, presumably when rats learn to get to realize that they were about to play, then presumably that's pleasant anticipation. But on day one, they won't know that, right? They're just two on either side of a barrier. What's going on? They don't know. So what, what about this first pre-play period? What happens there? Well, there's sort of a trend between the groups, but let's concentrate mostly on the fact that flats are quite prevalent, similar prevalence to trills. That's on day one when they don't know what's happening. On the final test, however, the rats now knew that they were going to be able to play and um, now trill calls predominate over flats. So not as, not as extremely as we sh showed during play itself, right? During play itself, flat trills were more predominant, flats were much less predominant, but nevertheless in the same direction. So then on that basis, um, it looked to us that various states of positive affect presumed um, were linked to increased trills and reduced flats. And then in subsequent published work, which I'm not gonna show, uh, naloxone and also acute morphine withdrawal, which were both demonstrably aversive in terms of condition place aversion, um, these produce the opposite shift. So, so far so good. It looks as if this hypothesis is holding up quite nicely, but wait, um, things get more complicated. So here, um, I'm going to tell you briefly about three drugs that we picked uh, at doses that were known for the literature to um, reliably produce place aversion, condition place aversion. And uh, we tested the effects of these drugs in a condition place aversion paradigm, where we're looking at the acute effects of the drugs on USV emission. And then afterwards, we established that indeed these drugs produce place aversion, and they all did. Very clear place aversion in each case. Um, what were the calls um, during the conditioning when the when the rats were under these aversive drugs? Well, no 22 kilohertz calls were elicited by these drugs. Um, and in addition, there was the the shift towards flat calling and away from trill calling that we'd seen with these aversive conditions did not consistently occur with these drugs. So this then suggests that this general hypothesis is not so general after all. Um, and then in more recent work, and now I'm going to describe work uh, done by a student in the lab, uh, Leila Erden and um, Aditi Sundra Krishnan. Uh, so this is uh, where we injected cocaine intraperitoneally to rats and uh, we, we tested it in drug naive animals and then we kept giving cocaine and then we tested when they were quite cocaine experienced. And so we get the expected change in flats and trills. So cocaine suppressing flats, promoting trills, 
But this only occurred when the rats had had many injections of cocaine. The problem here is that it's hard to relate to the euphoria hypothesis because we don't know what, I don't think I know of any humans that self-inject cocaine IP. Um, so there's no really no ground truth to go on. But what I really want to show you here is something else. And that is that in these drug experienced animals, cocaine is producing clear effects on some other ball subtypes. And this is both good and bad from my point of view. I was about to pack it in and say, let's go with a simpler call categorization scheme, maybe have four different types of calls, because that could probably be done quite easily with machine learning, uh, I think, based on some preliminary stuff we have. Um, but now we've got these other call subtypes that are affected by cocaine. So what does that mean? Hmm, don't know. And then it's not just drugs, but something else. So oh, I'll skip that slide. Um, let's go back to this kind of experiment. And we did a new experiment because there was something that was bothering me here from the results that we got many years ago. And that was that it didn't seem to make much of a difference whether the rats were separated overnight or not. Um, not it, it, it changed, it, it, it produced more play behavior if they were separated. It did not really affect their call emission. So I wanted to go back and do a, a user control group. So here we have a new experiment where we have the experimental group, which are going to be um, anticipating play, getting play opportunity. And then the control group is behind the barrier and remains behind the barrier in the subsequent five minutes, right? So, uh, and they were tested for eight days and we of course recorded uh, the animals and uh, because we're testing in pairs, uh, the N is the number of rat pairs. So essentially, if we look at play anticipation, then um, we're getting a difference here between the two groups. So the play group is making a smaller percentage of flat calls and trending towards a higher percentage of trill calls. Um, so that sort of goes along, I think, with the positive anticipation, positive affect hypothesis, flats and trills. I think that fits. But look, we've got other effects here on other short calls, uh, flat trill calls. They're changing as well. So what does that mean? Don't know. More, more research needed. It's complicated. Um, so on that uh, note, I think I'll finish and um, just say that we haven't quite got to uh, producing a uh, rat English dictionary yet. Um, I think we're just scraping the surface. There's a whole lot of stuff going on here. And I've only talked about call subtypes. We haven't analyzed acoustic properties of the calls like some other people have done. There are many different ways to analyze these data. Um, by the way, uh, some of our data are now uh, deposited online so people can mine it if they so desire. Um, and just remains to thank uh, the people who actually did the work, Jen Wright starting things off, um, Laura Best in between experiments, uh, Christina Lin who did the morphine withdrawal study, Tina, I didn't talk about her work, but uh, that was optogenetic stimulation of the mesolimbic dopamine system and uh, rats pressing a lever to get to self-stimulate with the opto. Um, and Hiromi did uh, some of the play behavior and then more recent uh, unpublished work that I described at the end uh, done by Rubing and by Leila and Aditi. So thank you uh, very much. Um, I'll take any questions that there are any. Jeff, I could repeat your question if you like, or you can come. Yes. Great. Oh, sorry. Great talk. <laughs> Wonderful talk. Um, you know, I think this is first in the comment. I think we need to do a better job as a field of, you know, pointing out how hard 20 killer vocalizations are to induce in animals. Um, you know, it really, there's a really high threshold for inducing them and only certain things will induce them. You know, and very vigorous stimulation is required. Um, but my my one question is more of a philosophical question that I got from an old mentor, Roy Wise. You probably knew Roy. I know. Yeah, and it was if if we want to make a therapeutic 
uh, what do we want the animals to be making more of the vocalizations? In Roy's term, do you want them to be pressing the bar more or pressing the bar less? You know, and I wonder how that re reflects on, you know, what, you know, especially in the in the movement in drug drug abuse, uh, they tend to get repurposed drugs or replacement therapy, right? And replacement therapy might might be useful there. And then my other question is, you know, we all, especially my, my very last experiment that I've run, I have a thousand hours worth of vocalizations. I must, I must move to uh, these, these automated uh, techniques. And what are your thoughts on how we can incorporate all these different segments? Or if maybe, probably won't work, but maybe we can do it on power spectrums and look at power at individual frequencies. Mm. So those are my questions. Oh, wow. Yes. So how would you make an antidepressant drug that isn't um, addictive? Well, we do have them already, right? So that's uh, to get to your first point. I think that's what you were getting at, isn't it? When you said therapeutics? Oh, oh, yes. Um, so, well, we have drugs that uh, substitute for um, addictive drugs, and we have drugs that try to counteract the effects of addictive drugs. So, uh, yeah, addiction is such a complicated thing, is it not? I mean, really. Uh, I try to do addiction research or USV research these days because it's bafflingly complicated. And the, your second point was about how to categorize calls, right? So the danger is, I think, that uh, we now have how many different publications with um, some sort of automated method of segmentation or classification of calls. And the only thing that I see in common between these papers using different approaches is they all say that they have the best method compared to the previous ones. <laughs> So how can we standardize a field where you might have one training set, I might have a different training set, the machine learning might produce, be using different criteria, would we necessarily know? Um, I suppose the only way would be to swap data sets and see if the uh, respective algorithms match. Yeah. And looking at absolute power and bandwidth. Right. So Jeff is um, suggesting Fourier transform and then not using wavelets, but using um, absolute power uh, to to try to classify calls that way. Yeah. It's beyond my pay grade, unfortunately. Yeah. It's, I mean, we've we've taken our calls to numerous statisticians and you know people, and they initially say, "Oh, this is an easy problem," and then they call us back, you know. <laughs> and maybe we're completely wrong about how we see these subtypes. That's the other thing. We're just using human eyes at looking at spectrograms, right? Yeah. Uh, so there is a, uh, a question from Zoom. Uh, what do you think uh, how the strain or the lack of breeding the rats uh, are influencing the USVs. So there is a st between strain and for sure, but for example, the same strain, but in different labs. Yeah, so this is one of the problems of uh, animal research, at least rat research, as I think Marcus or Rainer Schwarting has said, we shouldn't really call these rat strains, but rather rat stocks, because there isn't a, a defined, there's no definition of a long Evans rat um, anymore. And I don't know to what extent uh, we get our rats from Charles River, but I don't know to what extent the batches. Anecdotally, I would say that there are major differences between batches sometimes, you know, the rats that came in today versus a month ago or whatever. Um, and also sometimes we get, occasionally we get rats that are transported long distances, not from the usual facility. Um, and so I, I urge anybody who uh, to really figure out where your rats are coming from. And then um, another uncontrolled thing, and this isn't really part of the question, is, is are these littermates or not? Uh, you know, how many of us actually specify we don't want littermates or we do? Uh, so that's another thing. There are lots of um, differences reported in the literature. There's several papers at least I've come across where people get, let's say a given stock of rats, might be Wistar, it might be Long Evans, whatever it is, from let's say three different suppliers, and then they run them through tests, behavioral tests, and they're different between suppliers. Now, is it really a supplier difference there, or is it a possibly batch difference, right? So 
maybe if I took three different batches at different times from Charles River, I would get different results. This is not a way to do science, is it? But unfortunately, it's the reality we face, I think. Did that answer the question? Got a question. I got a question about those uh, the, the couple of period agonists. Yes, because you you said uh, of course it uh, you can see that uh, that, that, that you oh, yeah. you oh this is it. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, but you, you you said that the it uh, uh, the kappa against the U fifty four A eight yes yes don't use the the twenty two kilohertz okay mm. so uh, did you try to uh, give animals the uh, agonist so kappa agonist yep. and then give them amphetamine? So, uh, because the, probably uh, the, the, it will reduce the 50 kilohertz, not not induced 22 kilohertz, but reduce 50 kilohertz. Because, uh, I remember yeah, we, we did the, the experiments with the, this uh, kappa, kappa agonist, uh, and we give uh, animals f f 30 minutes before uh, social interaction uh, uh, after 21 day insulation, which mm -hmm. uh, yeah, before the encounter. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I the, do understand. The short answer we didn't do that experiment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think, I think it might be might be, might be worth doing. Yeah. Mm, thanks. Thank you. Mm.